Why did you want to find more gay Adventists? Because the pastors and the upper echelon uh, didn't accept us. We were outsiders. And I told them, I said, look, uh, God created all of us. If you don't like what they, he has created, then maybe you should move on. <laughs> they didn't appreciate that. God be the glory for the things you have done. With your blood, you have saved me. With your power, you have raised me. To God be the glory. I was raised in a, a fairly strict uh, Adventist family. Uh, my parents were second generation Japanese. Uh, firmly grounded in the Adventist Church, and all through my teen years, I remember being very, uh, you know, attracted to to boys. It was just, I mean, from way, way young. I mean, I knew that I was gay. I mean, yeah. I knew that was that I was different. That you know, from an incredibly young age, we became Adventists when I was in fourth grade. We were Catholics prior to that, and. Um, I went through all of, uh, you know, grade school, and then I went to what used to be called SMC, but it's now Southern Adventist University. And I didn't graduate from there. I only spent two years there, and I came back, became a hairdresser, and came out of the closet. I did not grow up Adventist. I grew up Catholic. But my first girlfriend was Adventist, and she had a daughter who went to Adventist schools, and we went to church together. So, were you raised in Adventist? No. Far from it. I was more uh, in between Christian and atheist. How did you become an Adventist or find ad Adventism? Met Carol Chancellor, who uh, became my pastor and my lover. And she was a pastor of the local church? No, he. He. Oh, he. Yes. Oh, yes. You know, I thought it was a, a phase I was going through, and I thought, well, you know, when I emerge on the other side of my teens, or, you know, when it's time to get married, you know, I'll, this phase will be leaving me, and I'll be able to get married and <clears throat> have a family. Early on, I realized that I was gay, even in, in grade school, as far as that I was attracted to boys, but then as I grew older and really um, processed that and realized that I was, and then also the challenges of being an, an Adventist and having parents that were um, work for the church. Um, it was really a challenge for me to process that and hearing what different people said and realizing that I was made this way and um, God made me this way. And, um, and then when my parents found out and the mindset in that day was change ministry, offering to send me to Reading, Pennsylvania, to Quest Institute. We wanted me to get into therapy, so I went and saw a therapist, you know, and, you know, kind of tried to work through my, you know, gay issues. You know, now kind of, you know, talking about it, it's like, you know, kind of the memory comes back about all of that, you know, amazing controversy stuff that I guess, you know, in some ways I've just tucked it away. But I guess I should also say at an earlier age, when I was in college, I went on a mission trip so that I could get away from evil gay San Francisco, and by going on a mission trip, I would be able to, you know, realize that between, you know, the Lord would work it out and I would be straight. And I kind of really didn't see, um, I don't know, a happy life or fulfilled life outside of the church. My conclusion was that, um, yes, I'm gay and I'm also a Christian, but that means I will follow the footsteps of the Apostle Paul, which means I will be celibate, okay? And that uh, even though I am gay, uh, I will not cross the line and um, act on the carnal desires. And so I said, well, you know, is it possible to live? I said, well, giving up a large part of the life that I, that I wanted to have for myself, but for God's sake, for my eternal life's sake, for what I believe to be as a Christian, I will do it. I wanted to be a minister. You know, I wanted to work yeah. on Tampa One. I wanted to be a youth yeah. pastor. All of this kind of stuff, you know. I, and then I went through a lot of time trying to deny it. You know, going up in Adventist, wanting to be married, wanting to be, a, you know. I, I saw my path ahead of me, you know, but the small thing, you know, being gay. You know. And the congregation said, Amen.
I first heard about kinship, I want to say an ad in The Advocate about 1980. And at that time, I was very involved with the church, played the organ occasionally, sang in the choir, all of that kind of stuff. And at that point in time, I still had not fully come out, but at least inwardly I had. I'd been reading The Advocate and reading other books and had come to the conclusion that being gay was A-OK. Um, then I read about this group and I went to my first meeting in L.A. I put an ad in, in The Advocate which basically said, gay Adventists write to me. I didn't know any, any gay Adventists in America, of course, mm -hmm. and I got between 40 and 50 replies. <laughs> I, I just didn't know how to handle it. I, I didn't know how to write to that many people, especially when there wasn't much opportunity to, to, to meet them. We were looking through newspapers and one of the newspapers was The Advocate and there was an ad there um, for looking for other Adventists at the time and they had a number and had an address um, and there were several of us there from you know my former roommates um, we were all hanging out in Chicago and I was the only one who actually wrote um, in. I think it was some West Coast people, Los Angeles or San Francisco, reaching out, uh, someone in New York City, uh, basically asking, you know, I'm gay, I'm Adventist, I'm wondering if there are any more, any others of you out there like myself, okay? And I decided, no, I don't want to contact them because that would set up the situation where I might be tempted to act on my carnal desires, and I can't do that. I'm not ready to do that. But I remember putting an ad in The Advocate and I believe it was Ben who contacted me and said that there was a couple others that were interested in getting together. And that's kind of how I got involved. But then when we started to really get organized, um, I have the, the distinction of being the first kinship editor, uh, putting the first newsletters together, which was kind of interesting because it's the reason I got kicked out of the church. I found out about kinship. I overheard people talk about kinship and it was usually from Adventist leaders, um, pastors or officials, and it was not in a positive note. Later on, I found um, other gay friends, Adventist friends, talking about kinship. And then um, Malcolm Askew, he was here in San Francisco also, and he's like, hey, you know, there's meetings here, let's go. It was a real feeling, you know, the idea of going to another church and people said, well, you know, there are other kind of churches, there's Sunday churches, there is, um, Glide was very accepting, um, Metropolitan Community Church, you know, was out there and very involved mm -hmm. in the community. But it wasn't my principles, it wasn't my values in terms of mm -hmm. that. That's why kinship really um, spoke to me and I felt like, okay, that's, you know, there's got to be something there that makes sense or doesn't make sense or whatever. We also started to have interface with kinship. And initially it was at Ben Bakel's house. Kinship was not just, you know, a club, but it was the place I got my spiritual food. Uh, and it was the place that I did ministry. And it was really, really important to me in those days. You know, to see um, gay and Adventist in print was a little shocking um, because it, I guess it's a, in a way that weighs a repressive society. And to see it out in the open was kind of a surprise. And I was curious, who are these people? Um, yeah, I just couldn't imagine. Which, to my surprise though, it was like, there were people like my friends. We, you know, we felt that you know, like, I think Jesus would have wanted to minister to us, and that wasn't happening. The um, ad and the advocate was part of that, looking for other Adventists. I was a youth leader at the time. I was a soloist. I was in several gospel groups. The biggest reason I wanted to be a part of kinship was because of the camaraderie that I lost during the time of, you know, being excommunicated. But I do remember kind of, you know, the early years of just kind of, you know, feeling like, the sense of belonging and a sense of well-being and a sense mm -hmm. of reason. There's a purpose. There was, you know, um, you know, 
I, I was not kind of a mistake of God. I wasn't, you know, kind of some, yeah. you know, accident. And so that was, you know, being around other people who felt that um, and who realized that was really powerful. And being able to listen to people's stories, I mean, that was a th the other thing that was just amazing. Mm -hmm. People, you know, their, the family stories of, and all of us, you know, having grown up in the church, you know, you know to kind of to just have the same common commonness of Adventism was pretty amazing. You know, the same mm -hmm. kind of things, you know, acceptance or not acceptance and, you know, how much did we want to be accepted by the church versus not. It was something that was needed because they were kicking all the people out of the church that they found out was, was gay. And I said, well, you know, it's for all of us, not just for the selected few. They couldn't disagree with that, of course. There was a lack of understanding, but the more we did, the better it got. And there then also came HIV and the AIDS crisis. And that was a real humanitarian challenge to people of faith. And I think that as people got outed because they were sick, uh, and those of us who took care of those folks, things changed in the community, uh, not just in the church, but in the community at large, uh, as we were forced to come out uh, with that. One of the things that happened with our little organization is that the, the church saw us being effective. One thing that Kinship has always been active in, activism, um, marches on Washington, activism about HIV AIDS, putting together an AIDS quilt, uh, finding ways to help um, AIDS victims, looking for ways to be uh, relevant to help educate people who needs information, and also that dialogue, always looking for a way to dialogue um, and looking for people to dialogue with. The use of camp meeting, uh, which is really pretty much established within the church um, every summer was um, something that came up as a possibility. And so it was something that was familiar with the members of the church. Um, and certainly that would be also familiar with the church itself. And so it would seem like the, the right uh, vehicle by which to, to start a dialogue or to have people come together. The first camp meeting was a life-changing experience. And we didn't know what to expect. We decided we were gonna have it in Arizona so I got to take another road trip and explored all the different places that we could hold a gay conference, which was kind of a challenge in itself because not people were not many people were excited about that. And we ended up at this place called Coles Ranch in Payson, Arizona. There were church officials there, not like the presidents and things like that. There were clergy, there were theologians, and they were there to kind of walk the journey with us. If we were having a camp meeting, the, the, the issue that was bothering us all at that time was, could we be gay and Christian at the same time? I said, we, we need to have the best people possible. And also, I don't think that uh, the church is going to want to talk to us. We need to have some emissaries who speak for us and who are well thought of, got, they've got status in the church. And of course, when you suggest things like that, you know who gets the job. <laughs> I got the job. The people had been struggling with their homosexuality and with the church in many, many different degrees, uh, much more than my, so myself, especially those who had worked for the church. Um, and so it was a way of exploring who we were uh, what our spirituality was, uh, what our standing should be. You know, it also gave us opportunities to be active um, in, in the, um, probably in the greater community. Because even at the time, even it was the early 80s, the, you know, we were still emerging out of Stonewalls. The cool thing is that clergy that were there have been allies all this time because it set the tone for them too, because they saw the humanness in each one of us. I was invited to some gay camp meetings, again, to serve as a chaplain or a counselor and be friendly with the individual people there. 
that was just as part of my regular visitation and going to see people who were sick or discouraged or needed visiting in one way or another. As my memory, you know, reminds me or it tells me, I mean, there were some speakers there who kind of weren't supposed to be there. Or if the church found out they were going to be there, there was potential backlash for them. Mm -hmm. But I also remember um, great theological discussions about who translated the Bible, you know, and all of this kind of stuff and where we get stuck on, you know, this mm -hmm. scripture, that scripture, and, you know, just kind of feeling like, you know, that's not what it's about. We did a... Um communion and that was something that had been established early on you know for the first couple of camp meetings that you know we wanted to have communion not necessarily in the way the church had it so we were experimenting with different ways to true to actually present the meaning of communion and the way that I think that's the part that was important and continues to be important with camp meeting it's it's a it's a place to bring um, in the way the brethren right together um, and there are common um, rituals, you know, f uh, recognizable ri rituals that we still keep that are become meaningful for us as we continue and grow and um, adapt those things to us. After I was disfellowshipped, I wasn't able to do any music. I was really, I really enjoyed that. That was just my thing. And I was able to do it again in kinship. Not only their camp meetings, but you know, just um, like when we go to church, we go to church together, that kind of thing. I could bring it back in my life, so that part helped. And there was a kind of a sol solace for me, a refuge, I guess. We went from the very, very serious thing of uh, not knowing if God thought we were okay uh, to the celebration of of. Uh, humor and music and all of that in a week. It was quite an emotional ride. It was, it was an amazing experience, you know, kind of, you know, bringing in the Sabbath and, you know, I mean, and being with people who know what that means, you know what I mean? I mean, you mm -hmm. know, I, um, I, mean, I mean, prayer is a part of my life. Everybody I'm involved in knows. <clears throat> My spiritualness is really important to me. Mm. And so to be with people yeah. yeah that's that's kind of the stuff that sticks with me about the camp meetings and the kinships and understanding the value of you know my spiritual self. The first night we started off by saying, just tell us your story. And one by one by one, people talked about what it was like for them growing up and then coming out um, as an Adventist. Errol's story just has stayed with me to this day. And I use it as an example of the way in which gay people are oppressed differently than any other group. When Errol came out to his mother, his mother said to him, I wish you had died in my womb. I can see him saying that and crying. <laughs> and to this day, I can't talk about it without crying myself. Um, it's such a um, such an example of the kind of hurt that happens to LGBTQ folk in their own families, in their own families. And so everyone got a chance. It went late. It was hours and hours. But for the very first time in most of those folks' lives, this was the first time that they had an opportunity to talk about what their lives were like. And it was absolutely life-changing for the individuals and for kinship as a group.
One of the aspects of kinship that is uh, that has made kinship so valuable and um, and enriched kinship in an, in in amazing ways are the allies. They are people that have embraced the journey with us. They have um, challenged us, but they've always been there. There's that unconditional love that, um, and some of these people have been doing this for 40 years. They have not given up. Parents writing books about their journey, people leading workshops, speaking, writing letters to church officials. Um, the list just goes on as far as how um, whatever they think they can do to just to help um, help people understand um, the LGBTQ plus journey. Uh, our youngest son, uh, when he graduated from Far Eastern Division, we received a call to go back to the General Conference, which is our world world church headquarters. Somewhere during those uh, years when he was in college, somehow little things that I had noticed through the years began to add up and I began to have an uneasy feeling that something was wrong. I didn't really know much at all about uh, homosexuality. I just had picked up the impression that it was bad. It was something that we don't talk about. But I knew that he and his girlfriend, he had, he had gotten engaged his freshman year. And I knew that they had gone to the church pastor there at the college for uh, premarital counseling. And then suddenly they broke up and something just didn't sound right to me. So I called their pastor. I asked him, do you think I should talk to Paul about this? And there was this long pause. He said, yes, talk to him, but don't say anything that will make him go in a direction we wouldn't want him to go to. So that was when I was confirmed in the uh, knowledge that he was gay. When I was uh, in college, I took a year out to work as a task force worker in New York City. My supervisor was Colin Cook. At that time, Colin was still very, very deep in the closet. Um, and I had no, no awareness, no suspicion of, of uh, anything other than that he was a heterosexual who was not yet married. And then about nine months into our time there, after my girlfriend and I had been ragging on him again, trying to hook him up with somebody, he finally told me his story up to that point. So as he tells me his story, you know, this is a story from somebody that, you know, very, very close. You know, if it was a stranger, you could dismiss all of that pursuit of, of wholeness and, you know, the effort to get himself fixed. You could just say, well, you didn't try hard enough. You know, I, maybe I could have discounted it. But, but as I listened to his, the, the agony of his story, it changed me. I was never able to, to think about gender and sexual issues the same after that. The Adventist Church, it's a conservative Christian denomination, grew, originated in the United States in the middle 1800s. High regard for the Bible, belief that all humanity is damned except for the saving blood of Jesus Christ. The particularities of Adventism, or the Adventist denomination, the, the, the elements there that I prize and that, that are important to me, Maybe the first one is simply that we reject the common Christian notion of an eternally burning hell fire. They said, no, no good God could actually burn somebody forever, no matter how bad they are. So when I became a pastor at Sligo, it's a large church, of course, Elder Dale Hannah gave us associate pastors assignments to me he gave to be pastor of the singles flock and so it was that i became aware of uh, aware of the people 
who were served by kinship and uh, would go to visit them in their homes. There might be a couple of women who pooled their resources financially and got an apartment together and lived together. A couple of guys might do the same sort of thing. Those were the first that I remember having contact with gay people. I was teaching Old Testament and archaeology at Andrews University uh, and uh, got a call in 1980, as I recall, from uh, someone from Kinship. And they said they were planning a retreat in Arizona and would like uh, me to come and talk about the problem texts in the Old Testament and to uh, get acquainted with the organization. The thing that I will never forget is the uh, night the people shared mm. their stories about their relationship to the church. And I mean, it was just heartbreaking to think of the way people had been treated. I remember one man who said that uh, his minister had gone around to his business associates in town and told them that he was gay and that uh, they should have no dealings with him, and it destroyed his business. Uh, oh, there were just countless stories of heartache. I mean, I, I, I wept to think that the church, which is supposed to be this uh, fellowship, that supports and helps, especially in time of need, would do the opposite. And uh, it was important to me personally because shortly thereafter, I found out that I had an important family member who was, who was gay. And this helped me relate in a way that otherwise I would not have been able to do. Through the years, I've been back to uh, Kinship Camp Meeting a couple times and uh, spoken on occasion and just visited at other times and made a lot of new friends, uh, many of whom I've stayed in touch with. And it's been a, a blessing to me. You're making some phone calls and asking a bunch of questions. I finally discovered that Bob Bouchard was the president. So I finally traced him down and got his number. And I had a very nice conversation with him. He explained to me what the purpose was and everything. In the course of the conversation, he invited me to come to California for the next kinship board meeting. And he said that I could have the worship talk, which would be at the beginning of the board meeting. I flew out there to California and attended this board meeting. As I, I gave the worship talk and then I just sat and listened. When we had a break, I spoke to Bob. My question was something about, you know, how would a person know whether they were gay or not? He asked me, he said, Dr. Babcock, did you ever sit down one day when you were younger and make a conscious decision whether you were going to be gay or straight? I thought about that for a minute and said, well, no, I never did have that conversation with myself. <laughs> I just am what I am. I never even thought about deciding to be gay or straight. And he said, well, that's exactly right. Gay people are the same way. They don't, they just come to the conclusion that that's what they are. I wrote a piece a long time ago. Carol Grady asked me to write it, I think. What would Jesus say to homosexuals? I looked at what Jesus said to the people that were around him. And his word was welcome. He welcomed them to his presence. He also gave uh, clear, daunting moral and ethical exhortations. 
And so while we welcome all, we also recognize that all of us are capable of engaging in relationships with other people that are harmful to them. And so Jesus would, would challenge us. That obligation to engage in activity that is not only pleasant for myself, but takes a full ethical notice of the other person. To me, that, that's where I would go with Jesus. While we lived in Lincoln, I decided to take a creative writing class from the, one of the teachers at the university there. And uh, one of our assignments was to write about some um, event that had been very emotional for us. Well, <laughs> this was definitely the most emotional thing that had happened to me. And so I wrote a story about how I found out that he was gay. And everyone in the class said, oh, you've got to write a book. The book actually came out in the middle of 1995. And a short time later, in January of the next year, I got a call from Doug Taylor at Walla Walla College asking me if I would be willing to come and speak at kinship camp meeting the next spring. It was a very emotional experience for me to hear all of those men singing the old hymns with such vigor and such feeling and um, it just brought tears to my eyes. And then when I got up and told my story, they gave me a standing ovation and I just really felt close to the folks there at, at camp meeting. One thing within, within an international organization, there's always going to be uh, differing views on how the organization should go. And one of those within um, an organization with a Christian background is how religious should kinship be or how secular should it be. And so camp meetings is that one time when everybody's getting together where um, there have been times when there has been um, some very strong opposition to having anything religious. And so there's that, still that challenge and that balance of um, religion and secular and how can we support both. And since kinship is so diverse, its mission is to, is to reach out to everyone, um, wherever they are, and support them in that, in that journey. Ben Pakel was the first president, and the second president was Vern Schlenker here in San Francisco. He happened to live here in San Francisco. And over a course of time, he became very frustrated with the hierarchy of an organization and getting approvals. So over time, he started talking about wanting to start another organization, and he was very open about that. In 1982, uh, you know, when Vern you know, resigned to go form Orion, and I got elected to be president in his place. Vern, as you, as you know, had that weekly family night where he would invite, you know, you guys from the San Francisco group. So in many ways, the San Francisco group, it was more close knit than anywhere else. And I think and what happened was Vern, on the, on the other hand, had a hard time um, putting up with delays and what he considered to be, you know, lack of enthusiasm and so on. But let's just say sometimes he felt, uh, you know, he wanted to get it done, you know, stuff done. So we'd want to skip to stuff where, and then I would have, you know, I do think that he and he and his relationship with Ron and, um, you know, was, you know, got worse and worse. And then ultimately, and this has all happened, remember, between 1980, September of 1980 and camp meeting of 82. Ultimately, Vern, of course, decided that he couldn't deal with this anymore. He had already started conceptualizing and putting together Orion. Um, so he was starting that and talking about it while he was president at Kinship. He was encouraged um, to resign from Kinship. Ultimately though, his uh, partner Craig uh, passed away, and I think it was after his partner Craig passed away that he came back and apologized and quit running Orion. And he wanted to be active again. And there was concerns about him being involved here in San Francisco where he had been before. But he had moved down to San Diego and they welcomed him to be their leader. So it was just a really uh, cool thing of reconciliation. And then when he passed away, Marge Doyle, who was then the president of Kinship, was the person that officiated at his memorial service. It's, it's a, the other thing is it's amazing that, you know, thinking about Vern and thinking about some of the other Kinship members who we have that we lost, you know, kind of in the mm -hmm. fight with AIDS and all of that. Um, 
you know, another blessing, I guess, that, you know, to be here, to be able to have the remembrances. Yeah. yeah. Huge thing, so. I think <clears throat> Vern was much more about, yeah, healing and forgiving and kind of, you know, moving on and in a way letting go of kind of all of the, that kind of uh, negativity that, you know, so many of us had gotten for years and years and years and years and really being able to come to a really safe place. Well, one of the things that I really, that always comes back to me is that folks from the Adventist Church are good people. And they don't hurt our community on purpose. <laughs> they do it primarily out of ignorance. At first, there was a lot of um, disbelief, like how can you have those two words together. Um, how could you possibly say that you're a Christian if you're gay? This was long before we understood um, the spiritual elements of being gay. Um, and many of us were, um, had a painful relationship with the church uh, and or with our own spirituality. Ron uh, negotiated with the church to bring some, what we called clergy, but some of them were educators and some of them were clergy, uh, to the first camp meeting. When Kitship was planning the first camp meeting, they decided to invite pastors and clergy and theologians to come and help them process in this discussion and this journey. So they asked a long list of people, and a lot of them were from Andrews University. And they felt, since there was a, quite a few of them, that they should get permission to go to speak and meet with, with homosexuals. So they went to the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists to get permission. They were given permission only if Colin Cook could also be, would also be one of the speakers. And in order to get them, the church said, okay, um, but we had to also... Uh, agree to have Colin Cook there. And that became a bit controversial because, as you know, Colin Cook was a defrocked minister who was in the, pro in the process of running uh, a change ministry. He believed that we were sinners. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we, we discussed it uh, and finally determined to go ahead and, and uh, have, you know, have both, both elements and we'd deal with both elements. Pastor here in Arizona saw one of the newsletters and saw my name in it, and they confronted with me with it, and that was the beginning of the end of me being kicked out of the church with a ceremonious um, disfellowship. I believe that uh, kinship could uh, influence the Adventist church, and that uh, we could uh, seek some kind of uh, accommodation, some kind of an acceptance, you know, where the Adventist church would accept us but as uh, the years went on, I realized that it was, uh, you know, there was some backlash, you know. I mentioned that I had, uh, I had heard about kinship in the, uh, the advocates. I had seen these ads, but uh, my mother, you know, a very devout Adventist, was also, had, was also a subscriber to some uh, underground newsletter, uh, Adventist newsletter, uh, whose mission was to inform the readership about the uh, ominous trends that were occurring within the Adventist church. <clears throat> and I remember uh, picking up that newsletter at my parents' home and reading about how a group of gay, gay Adventists were planning to organize and get together. We Adventists should be aware of that and should be on guard and you know, protect our young people from possibly very dangerous people. Okay? 
there's a reaction to these things, right? So the church reacted to us um, in various degrees. It was slow in coming. Um, so you have folks who were sympathetic coming out um, that worked for the church and were in a way at risk because even, I'm not sure what they do now, but in the early years, um, the church employees, whether pastors, educators, or others who came to camp meeting, felt like they needed to tell their employer that they were at camp meeting. And so they needed permission. Um, and that, of course, that meant that the church would, if you're giving permission to employees to attend this, um, this gathering of sinners, right? Um, how can you minister to them? Because they're going against the church tenants. So the, there is a nuclear reaction by the established church um, that, you know, I think it, it grew over time. Uh, I received a telephone call from the JC president's office. The president then was Neil Wilson. He said in a gruff voice, George, come to my office. No, maybe he didn't know. He wasn't even that informal. He said, Dr. Babcock, come to my office. So I went down to his office. He said to me, what do you know about kinship? And I said, I don't know anything. I never heard of it. What are you talking about? <laughs> and then he told me that there was this gay organization that uh, was operating out of California and uh, um, that they had sent this one page flyer and uh, it had been given uh, or sent out to every faculty member and every student at Andrews University. Well, I didn't know anything about it at all, but I quickly got a copy of what they had sent out, and it, it simply was an introduction as to what kinship was, and uh, it stated there that if anybody was having any questions about their sexuality, uh, if they thought they might be gay or lesbian, why here was a hotline number to call. And certainly when um, we started using the name Seventh-day Adventist along with kinship, um, which we actually had, I filed our papers early on, um, the church reacted very strongly with their lawsuit against us. Seventh-day Adventist kinship was incorporated in 1981, which says that kinship spread really quick internationally. Um, so it was in, in, it incorporated in 1981 that Seventh-day Adventist Church had not trademarked their name. And a few years later, they trademarked Seventh-day Adventist and a whole litany of different institutions and different words and things that they use. Uh, a few years later, they asked Kinship to cease using the name, which they did not. So then in 1987, the Seventh-day Adventist Church filed a lawsuit against Kinship to stop using the name. That went on for several years. Ultimately, Kinship won the right to continue to use the name, which um, did not help the relations with the church you know, going forward. Overall, I think uh, kinship was a way of integrating many of the facets of our lives, um, our spirituality, our everyday lives. And, but, you know, when you're in a church, you always have this looking forward to the second coming and you forget about the events. You only interpret the events one way of the world and it all points towards the second coming. Um, being gay, that becomes almost secondary, um, but what happens is that we need a place to anchor ourselves. And so the, I think kinship did that, you know, made us a reality, it is a re, in a way of a reality check. And so we were able to, within ourselves, find ourselves and explore. Well, I think kinship has played a vital role 
in helping educate the church, uh, those who've been willing to be educated. Uh, and so that need continues. And I hope that it will uh, continue to rise to the occasion and figure out ways that they can be helpful in that regard. So I don't know what, what's going to happen in the future, but I think it's inevitable that science is helping us to realize that we're all God's children. He's created us the way we are, that it's not a choice. I mean, I think that everybody at first thought it was a choice. My view over these now 40 years of all of this is that you know our members tend to go through, I think more often than not, a journey. Often they'll come in being quite connected to their church, quite in pain, quite religious, quite concerned with God, what God thinks of them. And then as they get more comfortable, I'd like to think kinship has part to do, part, you know, something to do with this, they go on a journey where they may or may not stay connected to their big church and or little, you know, or, and or home church. I look for the day when um, gays will be fully accepted and the denomination will come to terms with that and recognize that uh, uh, the way we are is the way God has created us. And so if he can accept us, why can't we, you know? I don't know how soon that will be. Uh, it won't be under the current administration, I'm pretty sure of that. But it has to come eventually. Yeah. Kinship has always been about ministering to people, opening their, their, um, their arms to anyone who is struggling with their, the process of coming out. And of course, families, um, it's a huge thing. And, can, and kinship continues to be a place for people of any age, gender. We have uh, special groups for the youth. They have their own Facebook. They have their own WhatsApp. My sense is whatever app there is their thing, you know, then they, they find a way to, to connect and, and be supported. And then there's the, the church liaison. And the church liaison, um, is that has become more and more one-on-one, -on -one, um, smaller um, congregations, groups, uh, working with people when um, upper leadership has been more closed off. And so if you come from this Christian background and you're asking, is there any way that I can still value the book of my childhood and the church of my childhood and still be who I am, I'm going, yes. And I, I can build that case from the Bible itself, from the actual words of Scripture. There is room for you. Uh, and in fact, if I did not make room for you, I would be doing wrong. I would be doing evil. I would want to say to you and to me and to all of us, The church does not own God, and the church does not own you or me. The church is a community, a family, and like every community and family, it has healthy elements and unhealthy elements. And if, if, if a family is sufficiently unhealthy, there are times when the only thing an individual can do to be healthy is to leave. I mean, in terms of uh, not simply theology, but personality, uh, we have made considerable progress in my lifetime that since that first kinship camp meeting in 1980, as I recall, uh, things, are, things are improving. And uh, I think that will continue. Of course, it's not a, a, a simple progress uninter uninterrupted. There are a few steps forward and a step or two backward, and that's just the nature of uh, human communities. But I am confident that things will get better because the facts are, are there. There are lots of social organizations that can feed a well-adjusted, you know, gay male with a Adventist background, 
and this organization can do some of that. But there are, no, you know, what we have uniquely is that we are there to be helpful to people who are trying to figure out their Adventist background and so forth. So, so you know, I, you know, one of the things the organization wrestles with is that why do we lose people? And what I'm trying to give you, if you hear that from others, some people mm-hmm. agonize over it. And my feeling is, is it's a healthy thing. Mm-hmm. You know, kinship is here for people when they need it. And hopefully, you know, they, they feel like they want to give back, you know, and, you know, and, and give to others later. You don't need to be a different group. You are yourselves committed to God and Him to you. So I just wish you the best, the best and happy, effective lives as Christian people. God bless you, each and every one. I have, I think, probably just about as many LGBTI friends as I do other kind of friends now. And I, I know that you have had to go through some really sad and difficult experiences, and my heart breaks for the, um, the way the church has not been helpful to you. But I want you to know that Jesus loves you. Jesus loves all of his children, and I think he has a special place in his heart for those who have had to to, uh, live through the years when the church has not been what it should be for you. So I want you to know that when Jesus comes, He takes all these things into consideration. And he, even if you're no longer part of the church, that doesn't mean that you won't be in heaven. And I would wish that I could give to you and to everyone the assurance that the rising of the sun is the smile of God. God is as accessible as the great blue sky. He engulfs us, we are His, and He is ours, period. So please have courage and try to um, be patient with the church. I I know it's hard, but I think that uh, we're coming along slowly but surely.